Welcome to Bethel Brothers Hot Rod. Got an update for you as we haven't did one of these in a while. Got to do some work to Project Chevy. And as you can see by my garb, it's cold, stormy. We've got tornado warnings right around here. Dude. So stick around, stay tuned, and I'll show you what's uh, going on there. All right, so here's the deal. Joe's old distributor, HEI. What broke on this, see where these screws are right there? Those actually blew off and broke. Underneath there, there's a set of springs. Can't really see it, but there's a set of these weighted springs. So as the rotor's spinning around, the springs catch on the centrifugal force, spread out and make contact. Tick, 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 throwing power, shooting it down to your spark plugs. Get it, get it, get it. Well, one of them broke, and Joe had a JB weld a pin in, which screwed up the centrifugal action of the HEI ignition. It made this piece impossible, so he was going to have to replace it. They wanted a whole bunch of money for this, as these are not cheap. So he got uh, another one and put it in, and... Damn, the Fed ain't running better, except for today, because he left his lights on and the battery's dead, so I'm going to charge his battery for him. Might have to go get him another one. We'll see. We'll see if that works. But I can go over some tips and tricks we use for finding top dead center on your number one cylinder. You might like them. You might not. I don't know, but they're tips that I use, and they work well for me and other YouTubers. So... We'll see. Stick around. Go check some stuff out. Got to run out in the rain and grab the battery. All right. So I got the battery charging. Charger's on. One thing I can recommend is that you keep your terminal posts clean. I like to use a low grit sandpaper. This is 220. You can see the junk that came off it. That does impede your electrical conductivity. You can also use a wire brush. Oh, it's a little harder. Kind of dunk, 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 dunk. This, you just put it on and and you're done. And it saves you time. Now, to Joe's defense, this power problem he's having isn't due to just the distributor alone, nor is it due to him leaving the lights on. It's the wiring that our dad did in the truck back in the 70s, late 80s. He just clipped into lines and teed off and kind of put them together and wire netted them. you got to do it like Sam make some power post blocks and run stuff off and think about it rather than just making spaghetti mess. Uh, while that's charging, I can talk to you a little bit about the distributor stuff. Okay, remember when I was saying that there's some weights underneath here that I can't show you that the springs broke on and Joe had to put a post in with some JB Weld. In this configuration, in this picture, I've kind of shaded one of these the Santa one's there, this one's right there. When this is spinning, they're hooked up to springs and they spin out and they're what send power to the rotor. <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure which one he had a JB weld, if it was this one, if it was this one, but one of these got JB welded in, the posts that went in it. And it was screwing it up because it broke. When that thing broke, it just, it... You saw the cap, okay? Stuff blew out the side. These springs that hold all this junk together are calibrated for specific imbalanced swingage. So if you stretch one out, if something's impeding it, they don't both spin out and gives you misfires. So that's why he replaced the distributor. Now, when you shut the truck off, at any given point, it's not going to go back to top dead center, which is where you need it to be. So this lines up with your number one spark plug, which is top dead center, and then you follow it out from there, putting them, putting your uh, spark plugs on the top of the cap. Now to find that, there are a couple tricks that I use, and you don't need special tools. Okay, first off, Joe put these in, in place of the Ford plugs that he got at uh, the AutoZone or wherever he went. So, that's a good, that's a good start. Anyway, this block of wood is going to represent the motor block. This would be the distributor. 
These are the one, three, five, seven cylinder. This is two, four, six, eight. It's always the even numbers on the passenger side and the odd numbers on the driver side facing the cab of the truck or the car or whatever you have a Chevy V8 in. Joe's is a 327, but they're not much different. Sometimes the firing order is different on the distributor, thus I didn't write any numbers on there. You have to look up your specific models. Anyway, for finding top dead center, an old trick that I would use was you put your thumb over the socket bay and you bump the motor over and when pff, the air pops out, it's in the upstroke and blowing all the air out, thus giving you top dead center. You can also look under the valves when they're both down. That's another good example, but that's a lot of work to take that off. It's a lot easier putting your finger over it. Now, if you're doing that alone, there is a trick that my dad used to use. He would take a spark plug, bust off the end, and drill through it. On the end, uh, he would put one of these rubber gloves. So while he was bumping it, when it finally came around and blew up the, the air, it would wave at you from inside the truck. I'm there. I'm at top dead center. You can use uh, stuff like a pencil or a piece of wire and double check at the depth in which it goes in. If it's in pretty far, you want it to just bump the top of the piston. Now that's not exact, exact to the millimeter depth dead center, but it's a good place to get you. And then when you're setting your distributor, oftentimes you want the rotor indicator to be pointing off in this area. Sometimes it's hard to get it back there and it'll end up over here. Now you can try to rotate it because of this sleeve at the bottom end. has to fit in it specifically. But if that's the case, this is now your number one cylinder location. And then you follow your firing order after that and then tighten it down. And you should get spark, which Joe did. And that's your tip and the trick on the cheap without using special tools to find top dead center. You pay attention there? It's the only time I'm going to say it, babies. All right. One other question I keep getting is how does Joe's truck run on the propane? Up north, it's very common. Um... <clears throat> It does run on both gas and propane, and rather than trying to show you inside Joe's motor, this is probably the easiest way for me to show you this. Now, Joe's truck was done, uh, converted late 70s, early 80s. I was like this tall, so I don't really remember. Um, but I do have the understanding of it, and if you bear with me, I'll show you what I know. Start with the propane tank in the back. Propane boils at 44 degrees below zero. So say you have this much propane in it. As it boils, it pressurizes inside the tank with vapor because it's boiling at 44 degrees below zero. That's why it works so good in cold temperatures where gas would freeze and separate. Anyway, it'll pressurize in here. It'll go down a line in a pressurized vapor form and it continuously does that. As you use it, it boils more, causing more pressure. So there's always a constant pressure in here. I'm not exactly sure what the PSI is, but it's, it's got pressure. It'll follow down the line to a regulator where it makes the pressure more compatible with what the motor can handle. It'll go out from the regulator, just like at your house or in a camp cook stove. There's always a regulator associated with the gas line. It'll go into what I call the collector. It bolts onto the top of any carburetor. They come with a kit. Now there's also a bypass on the side that you can order for a car that'll run back to the gas line, come out and under and back under to where it bolts onto your standard carb that you've always run. So with a flick of a switch, you can run on gas or you can run on the propane. They don't like both. No motors have ever liked gas and propane mixed. They run better on propane. You don't need the floats in the carburetor with propane. As you hit the gas accelerator on here, it'll dump what it has inside there for more acceleration or it flows at a constant idle rate.
That's why you need this top thing and the regulator. Or it doesn't work. Hopefully that kind of lets you know how it works. There's kits online that you can look at for conversions. Uh, this is actually cheaper right now if you get it in the vehicle uh, form. There's like commercial, home, and vehicle rates. And the vehicle rates are under $3 where this stuff is getting really close to 4 Or it's at $4. So, hmm. Hmm. Alright, people, so there you have it. I don't let the battery charge. It's storming. I'm not going to sit out here and watch it charge. Oh, something on that propane? That is what led them to want to do fuel injection because you can go at any pitch and yaw and whichever and the motor doesn't stall out. So that is the granddaddy of fuel injection right there. It's a better, better application. The car performs better. And you get a lot more mileage out of propane. We're talking hundreds of thousands of miles more on your motor because it wears less and it doesn't pollute. I mean, at all. It's good stuff. So, yeah. Hope you found this stuff useful, people. Thanks for tuning in and watching Bethel Brothers Hot Rod. Peace out, babies.